body, you know, mechanisms are pretty ubiquitous things, and this granite quarry here is pretty well stuffed with them. These machines are collections of mechanisms which control their movements and make them perform specific tasks. All the machines in here are very carefully designed to do exactly the one thing of snapping off bits of the granite hillside, turning them into little lumps like that. Some mechanisms aren't designed at all. They create movement by accident. This mechanical goat is simulating an accident that may cause an avalanche. Or it may not. The essential difference between the quarry machines and the avalanche is the degree of predictability. I want the machines I make to work predictably, even if it's only to guarantee that this jackal always misses the flight. In the difficult game of snooker, the constraint of the level playing surface allows a skillful player to predict how the balls will move. Oh, I caught the black. Hmm? These balls are hanging in a frame, and they're much more constrained than Ray reared and snooker balls. They have to swing in this arc, so that the result is much more predictable. Most people are like me, tourists in the realm of engineering. We see the sights, but we don't necessarily speak the language. But in our dealings with the physical world, we do get some kind of insight about the way things will go and how hard to send them. It's clear from looking at the mechanisms of living creatures, or dead chickens in this case, that a clever person might think of making a mechanical model of one of these, or of a human being for that matter. And the automatists of the 18th century in Switzerland made a terrifically good job of it. Mechanisms are a balance between freedom and constraint. Too much freedom, and this mechanical boy's writing would be illegible. Too much constraint, and he'd stop dead. I made this little man to illustrate some aspects of freedom. Not the Nelson Mandela kind of freedom, but the more restricted ideas that engineers have about freedom, which is the freedom to slide or pivot or rotate. And I've made him with similar freedoms to the, those that the human body has. And he'll also sort of settle into quite reasonably human, if rather fey, attitudes in the case of this little person. What it lacks, from my point of view, is some kind of motive power to make him work. I mean, I'm not going to stand around here all day waggling him. Oh, he's gone. Death of Chatterton. People and animals are more complicated than machines. They're wayward and unpredictable. If I wanted a wayward and unpredictable method of controlling the actions of a figure, I'd use string, not my favourite material. Careful work has been done to keep the strings in this cat tight until the poisoned milk takes effect. Then the strings are released and it dies a variety of deaths. I want to make a new machine that contrasts the rigid state of the living cat with its haphazard collapse. There'll be a strict, controlled woman with an emotionally unstable man. I'm going to call it bad news. One of the characters is a boy and the other character is a girl. I've got, got one of my normal boys here. who's a rather dim-looking individual with a, a blank expression on his face. When I look at dogs, you know, when people look at dogs, they, they look at them they, if they're sentimental fools. They think that the dog knows everything they're talking about and understands. And I believe that with my little people, the blankness of expression allows the person looking at it to paint whatever picture of what's going on in their mind they like. This is the recipient of the bad news here. And he's only just held together. I've made him so that he's really almost an equivalent of an avalanche. It wouldn't take much to make all these parts dismember themselves. They're just held together rather tenuously by strings and wires. I've started making this little figure here, who all she does is get up, really, which would seem to be a simple enough thing in itself. But if you were to get up with your body leaning backwards like that, it's most un 
unnatural and actually you can't do it. You have to lean forwards before you get up. So there has to be an ancillary mechanism here that makes her go forwards like that. Then she goes up. Trouble is now she's leaning forwards, which doesn't look right. So there has to be another mechanism that makes her straighten up. So all these strings have to be controlled by the feeling there's going to be quite a lot of messy mechanism under here. I've been fiddling about with her head for a very long time now, and I've decided to use a mouth like this for her to deliver the bad news. She wants to get rid of the poor schmuck. And that slots into her head, like so, and is operated by this piece of wire pulled down by a fishing weight. As you can see, her body bends all over the place, and I've got to get this signal to her mouth to make it work. And it comes all the way down here, down that flexible shaft, and the fishing weights emerge at this slightly embarrassing spot here, so that I can make her work like that. It was very stiff at first, but I used a bit of talcum powder to squirt down there, and it made it uh, all nice and loose. This means, though, that she'll only operate when she's sitting down, so she'll have to deliver her message in the seated position. And then when she stands up, of course, all contact with the machinery is lost. I made a box here now to stuff the machinery into, and I've just guessed the size of it, but I know I'm going to have to take it to pieces a hell of a lot of times to try the machinery out, so I made it this tenoned wedged construction. It says top on there, which means it's the bottom. This is my square camshaft that has the various cams that make her rise and fall, and it works her mouth too. This is the one that makes her tilt forward. This makes her tilt back. This one makes her ankles work. This one works her knees. And this huge one, paradoxically, is the one that works her tiny little mouth. That one there is the one that releases the man. And this big wheel here is the gear wheel. Each turn of the camshaft is one performance and I wanted to go round about that sort of speed. I have to devise a mechanism that will produce a nice smooth but powerful drive. This is where I control what happens. Now the next, the next thing that happens is for the camshaft to get put into this cradle here and I've done something I didn't really mean to do I've put this clock spring in because I thought it would be quite nice to be able to wind this thing up and then step back from it and watch it working. When I slot this into place, and let her go. Well, that was a bit too quick. She needs a governor. <laughs> I'm going to have to get something to slow her movement down. This paddle here has to push the air out of the way, and that takes time, so it's slowing the whole operation down. OK, I'll have to hurry now. Well, I have a feeling this person is going to make me extremely annoyed with him. I, I think for his sake I ought to leave him alone for a bit. It's come a hell of a long way from the intention. Well, the pubs are open, I'm going to go and have a drink and start again tomorrow and show it you when it's finished. This is just about finished now. It's as much as I can do to it. I'd better explain this rather bizarre paint scheme here. She's dressed in this Jaguar costume because having a sort of tight cat suit there would make all her interesting little joints more obvious. The thing is now that I have to invent this rationale that they've been to a fancy dress party, which is always a dismal affair, in my experience anyway. He really is a scout, of course. This is just his old uniform that he had. He's, he's been in the scout so long, he's collected almost every badge you could possibly imagine. Let's go.
the silly thing is that I've just made this big machine completely obsolete by producing a smaller, neater pocket version, which has all the features of the other one. And he collapses in his chair and resets himself, which is really a tremendous improvement. Head back into place. So I've wasted rather a lot of time making the big one. I'm going to carry on with little ones from now on. A striking performance from a remarkable mobile clock. Just one of the strange machinations in next Sunday's programme. Same time, 5.45.